press it forward. Do you know the game children play? The one called pass it forward. They pass forward a word from one person to the next. They whisper it in the next child's ear. The game varies, of course. Sometimes they tap each other on the back, tag your wits, something like that. But the idea is the same. Why do you think I'm saying all this? I will tell you a word, tap you on the shoulder and say pass it forward, and someone else will accept and carry my burden. The chain must not be broken. One mustn't stumble, confuse or misinterpret the forwarded message. Indeed, people's destinies sometimes intertwine in the most fantastic way. Nothing is ever accidental. Muhtar Awezov, Abay Kunanbaev and Anna Nikolske. In one way or another, their names belong in the same group. She entered the world of Kazakh culture by the initiative of Muhtar Omarhanovich. He opened before her the immense Kazakh sky. When speaking of the Muhtar Omarhanovich tandem with Anna Borisovna, one should probably mention that it was more of a trio than a duet. The three of them were united by their acute sensitivity to the historical era and a similar understanding of people and the country. They also shared a common understanding of their culture. Chapter 1. In the future. With tenderness and excitement, Abba is observing the world around him. He's looking at the vast steppe, the open expanses and the hills where he was born and spent his childhood. He wants to embrace it all and cover it with hot kisses. Anna Borisovna was here. She sat in this chair and on this couch. Of course. Nikolskaya's great-grandfather, a relative of Dmitry Danskois, was also called Dmitry. During the Kulikov battle, Dmitry Valinsky decided the outcome of the battle with his sudden attack. It was the game they played. In order to be accepted into one sacred literary society, they had to produce their family trees. Lelouse was Anna Borisovna's nickname for our wizard's daughter Leila, who also had a lot to be proud of. The great Abai was a relative. However, the society did not last long. He was imprisoned from age 30 and until he turned 32. He spent two years in prison. In the years that followed his release, he endured constant attacks, shadowing and accusations for as long as he lived. Naturally, he was frightened of it all. The slightest mention of a secret society put him on edge. I'm friends with three generations of our Zivs. She was more than just a friend to them. She was part of their family. Anna Borisovna used to address Leila as my daughter. She had no children of her own. She had an avid imagination and was very creative. Naturally, the children adored her completely. When Anna Borisovna was babysitting the children, Muhtar Omarhanovich knew he had nothing to worry about because the children happily showered her with attention. They loved and respected her. Year 1920. It took her a while to agree to meet with Lenin. She was finally persuaded to do so by Commissar Chicherin's relatives. It is your destiny to always be wrongfully accused, Vladimir Ilyich told her. He put his hand on her head and said, Life will be hard on you, girl. Life was indeed hard on the young Anna Borisovna. In 1917, she graduated from the Institute for Noble Maidens. In 1919, the Red Army had her father executed. Professor researcher Fet and Pushkin, a lawyer, a famous poet, and one of the closest associates of Tsar Nicholas II. They say his body was fed to the beasts at the zoo. She loved him very much. This was the wound she never recovered from. The elder brother, a white guard officer, was killed in the Civil War. The second brother, a communist and a secret agent of Joint State Political Directorate, was executed in 1937. Her mother suffered a mental breakdown after her husband's death and moved to Almata, where she later hanged herself. Anna was arrested in November 1933. During the interrogation, the investigator smashed her head with a pistol handle. She was sentenced to an administrative exile in Kazakhstan for three years. Given her state of health, she was allowed to travel alone without an escort. She was expected to pay for her trip herself. In Almaty, she taught French and learned Kazakh. She came here and got a job. She started translating the epic Kizjebek. This is how they met. She was accepted into the Union of Writers as a consultant and entrusted to translate Kazakh poetry. March of 1935, the city of Almata. A meeting of the Union of Writers is underway. Translation of Kizribek is under discussion. Awezov came in a little late. My first impression of him was that of a very bright man. He was young. He had the kind of face that really stood out. 
a dazzling smile, his large, slightly bulging eyes sparked brightly. Hello, my name is Awezev, and he flashed his smile again, so friendly and dazzling. All my work-related hesitations and doubts immediately found support. I have found my friend and supporter. Sometime later, all copies of the poem Kuzjebek translated by Nikolska were withdrawn from libraries and stores. She was sentenced to 10 years without the right of correspondence. 3,650 days, 10 years is a fatal figure which was burned into my soul and ached painfully like a stigma. In the 40s, there were people sentenced to 25 years in prison and everyone regarded them with a smile. The term was considered exaggerated, unrealistic and fake. There is no way that could be true, therefore the worst sentence one could get was 10 years. However, not many would live to be released, many will die before the end of their term. Year 1937, excerpt from the testimony of Agent Mali, Nikolska said, First it was the Ukrainians who were being persecuted and imprisoned, then the Belarusians and now it seems to be the Kazakhs' turn. Their statement appears to be a reason for another arrest. The sentence was six months in the Almaty prison, followed by Sevural Lag. Chapter 2. Following the way of Abai. Worn out, I was cheated by everyone around. I have been betrayed by my foes and my friends. Among the people who are close to me, as well as those who are distant, one can hardly find a single person who has not been the cause of bitter anguish. This is the table where Muhtar Omarhanovich wrote the first and second volumes to the way of Abai. This table was in another apartment on Kalinian Street in the housing complex number no. 5, a silent witness to Awezev's creativity. He knows exactly how difficult the work process was and he was the first translator of the way of Abai. She proved very receptive to the spirit of the time. In order to be able to translate literary works like Muhtar Awezev's The Way of Abai, one had to be proficient not only in the basic Kazakh or merely the elementary Kazakh language. The task lay much deeper. It required a full understanding of the book's historical atmosphere. The ability to sense the atmosphere of the historical period was one of her many talents. During the war, the supply of the concentration camps deteriorated. Dying people became a burden which prompted the mass release of prisoners that followed. And then Nikolska was among the released. She never had the inclination to complain about her life. She never talked about what she had experienced in prison. Inciting horror, pain and fear, they are crawling around not unlike the living dead, with no arms of legs on crutches. They are the dirty remains of what was once human, an overbearing stench is coming from the piles of debris, the evil edge of the famished crowd, broken fragments of life. My God, the country's sad wreckage. Spring of 1943, concentration camp clothes, some change earned over the six years behind bars and most precious item, the certificate of final release. The road to St. Petersburg was closed. She headed to Almaty. She was not allowed to reside in the city. Trying to find housing, she ended up renting not even a room, but a corner of one somewhere in the suburbs. She paid her rent by helping the landlady's son with his homework. To keep from starving, she wrote doctoral and candidate dissertations for other people. Under the table in this room, there was no other place for her. She made an office for herself under the table. That's where she worked on her translations. She was like a leper, afraid to go out in the street, held under supervision at all times. Every week she had to report to the authorities as a potential criminal. She kept away from her friends and acquaintances, and they kept their distance as well. Associating with an exiled person was punishable by a prison sentence. Muhtar Awezev was one of the very few who offered Anna Barisevna their support. A lot has changed around here during the time that I was away. The people, their interests, concerns and hopes. And among these distinct changes, the one that was especially touching to me was the joy and kindness with which I was received by the Awezo family. She talked very little about herself, nor was she very talkative when it came to discussing Awezo even later after political rehabilitation. People were hesitant to talk freely. Despite being the author of such a great work of genius, a recognized masterpiece, he found himself in the position of a man who was about to be removed, about to be taken away. Mukhtar Omar Hanovich asked Anna Barisevna to translate The Way of Abai. For her, it was much more than a work opportunity. It was a chance of surviving. For our reserve, he was under the supervision of the authorities. It was a big risk. In 1949, he receives the Stalin Prize, and in a couple of months, the devastating article comes out. 
He was never defended. He was constantly haunted by accusations of nationalism and admiration of the feudal past. It was akin to suicide to imply that the epic Stalin prize-winning poem was translated by the enemy of the people. In the first editions, it was printed that the book had been translated and edited by Leonid Sobolev, a well-known and very influential Soviet writer. Chapter 3. A Lifelong Friendship Abai suddenly felt orphaned, lonely and exhausted. The feeling of loneliness seized him with an incredible force. Something painful stabbed Abai in the heart. He was drawn to the village, to the people. His soul was filled with nostalgia and affection for them. There was nothing incidental about it. Nikolska translated the songs in the film, again by the initiative of Muhtar Omar Khanovich, but her name was not mentioned in the credits. For a long time, her name was not mentioned anywhere. It was my translation of The Way of Abai, which received worldwide recognition and has been translated into many languages. There were also problems with the financial compensation. Even our Wazif was unable to help her. Anna Barisovna refused to translate the third and the fourth volumes of The Way of Abai. The third volume was translated and edited by Sobolev. The fourth was completed by Zoya Sergeyevna Kedrina. All in all, there were five translators. One of them was Nurtazin. Several chapters were translated by Anov, but Muhtar Omar Khanovich was always unhappy with all translations done after Anna Barisovna. During the decade of Russian literature, after the 20th Congress, Leonid Sobolev arrived in Almaty. At the presidium, he headed straight for the microphone and said, I have just been told that a wonderful woman, Anna Barisovna Nikolska, is alive and lives here. She translated the first two volumes, and we couldn't put her name in the credits. We were forced to put mine instead. I rushed outside and called Anna Barisovna from the payphone. Anna Barisovna, Sobolev has just finished speaking. He has confessed everything that had happened, the reason why your name could not be mentioned. Are you happy? Silence. Lunichka, she replied at last. Did he say anything about the payment for numerous publications? It's not surprising for Anna Barisovna to have mentioned the translator's fee she was owed. She spent most of her life in abject poverty. In 1961, Muhtar Omar Khanovich suddenly died. It doesn't matter how much we cherish or how well we treat a person. The moment they leave us forever, we suddenly become acutely aware of the tragic meaning of the word never. We can't help but think about all the things we may have wronged this person, all the ways we may have failed to do, think or feel something vital for them, and we will never have that chance again. My mother never lost touch with her. She did everything she could for her, tried to help in any way she was capable of. With the medicines, the doctors, she tried to ease her life as much as she could. Until the end of her life, they enjoyed the best and warmest relationship. A lifelong friendship. God gave me the heart of a hero, but put it into a weak body. Anna Barisovna used to say, at the end of her life, she was often ill, suffered two clinical deaths. She continued to work on her novel, Pass It Forward. She considered it the most important book of her life. I'm always being fooled by the publishing house. I do not believe their promises anymore. I will be happy if my book comes out at all this year, and I will be given the money that I do not have. The book was published only in 1989, 12 years after Anna Nikolska's death. She suddenly said, I have been summoned. A KGB general stands at attention in front of me and salutes me. I'm sorry, Anna Barisovna, he says. What we have done to you is unjust. Please forgive us. And I said to him, what can I say to you? My life has been irrevocably ruined. Are you able to fix that for me? She was a talented writer, but only wrote three books. She was a gifted translator, but never received the recognition she deserved. In 1977, Anna Barisovna passed away. Life has generously bestowed upon me the joys and the sorrows, the knowledge and experience, causing me to hesitate and make mistakes, become weak, then dust myself off and get up. Have I fulfilled my life's duty? Have I told and taught people everything I was blessed enough to know myself?